So uh, my name is Saurabh Devendra Singh, as has already been stated, and I thank you all for letting me in this forum. Uh, even though I've never physically attended this forum, I have been a big fan of the archives. And if you ask anybody in my team, I have regularly recommended a number of these uh, for them for understanding and for myself also for understanding how investing should be done. <coughs> so in this context, when uh, I was first, when I first got a phone call that uh, I uh, uh, would be attending, I would be moderating a session for Sandeep Kothari, who's an investor I ever. It was a no-brainer. Now, there was one problem. Uh, uh, the problem was not of pollution. I'm a Delhi boy, so I'm quite uh, comfortable with pollution. The problem was ever since I moved into entrepreneurship about eight months ago, I've never really won a suit. And uh, that, if you combine it with my expanding waistline, which the more... Uh, a discerning out of you would have noticed was a complex problem. Thankfully, I've somehow managed it, and uh, Jitendra helped out by keeping the session before lunch. So thanks a lot for that, Jitendra. Uh, now let's get on to the good part, which is uh, Sandeep. Now, Sandeep Kothari does not need an introduction. His body of work uh, talks for itself. But in the interest of tradition, I will introduce him. Sandeep has an illustrious 26-year career in financial markets out of which a majority has been in Fidelity. Now, Fidelity for the uninitiated is one of the larger global funds and has a deep research methodology. Sandeep initially joined Fidelity as a metal mining steel and healthcare specialist based out of Hong Kong. And subsequently, he moved from there to head the India office and manage money. During his time with Fidelity, he was awarded the Fund Manager of the Year Award by Business Standard in 2007. Now, in early 2020, Sandeep set up East Lane Capital, which he built on the ethos of long-term fundamental investing, being selective and only onboarding clients who are in sync with the fund philosophy and also having his own skin in the game. Outside investing, Sandeep is into fitness and has successfully completed the Endurance Marathon and Half Ironman. Wow. Uh, over the last 15 years, I've interacted with Sandeep multiple times. There are many words that I've associated with him. Brilliant, modest, diligent, patient, analytical, etc. But one ability that is truly unique to him is his ability to simplify complex things and put it clearly. This is the topic that Sandeep would be talking today. Sandeep. Thanks, Aura. Uh, lot of good words said, so I owe you a dinner now for that. <laughs> uh, one caveat, a lot of repetitions will be there, so the idea is to hammer down the value principle and how to think about investing. But uh, I guess each one of us will take a different stab at it, so hopefully uh, you take uh, something out of it. The topic I chose is like deep simplicity. Uh, we live in a complex world. Everything is complex around us, uh, but within all this complexity, there are usually general simple principles which drive all this complexity. So if you think about the whole animal kingdom, it's the DNA which is the common code. You think about a Van Gogh painting, seven basic colors is what is needed, which creates these complex, beautiful things. All music is based on 12 notes, so any great symphony the underlying is 12 notes and two rhythms. So basically, overall, in the whole world of complexity, there are simple principles. And when you take the world of science and think about scientists, they usually try to break down these complex problems into simple components, think about how they interact with each other, come up with simple principles which try and explain these systems. The caveat is they try and explain the system but not predict things. So taking this sort of a framework, let's see how we can apply this to investing. So when we think about investing, the basic principle is we are trying to create wealth over a period of time. One simple truth is that value is some total of future profits. So any business, the value of that business is some total of future profits. How far ahead, uh, 
one doesn't know, and that's the job to try and figure it out, but it is some total of future profits. But profits are in future. There are many variables, lots of uncertainties, and there are actors involved in the market which are very emotional. That is all of us, and that really creates the complexity to the overall markets. Can we think of a framework now, knowing this sort of a backdrop of how to deal with this complexity then? So if you break it down, there are three basic things. The business and the management, which is equal to profits. And then the job is to try and value these profits. And we'll just try and sort of peel each of this and see how we kind of, uh, 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 or what can we do about it. So thinking of a business is basically, you have to understand how this business makes money. What is it that drives this business? If it is an airline, does it like fill passengers? If it's a movie theater, again, sort of gets people in. Or if it's a steel company, you get iron ore, coal, put it together and make steel and what is required. So how the business makes money, what are the key drivers? It's a growth business or it's very cyclical because it's mature or within growth there is cyclicality. How capital intensive is the business? <clears throat> Understand the unit economics, return on capital, all of those things. And also important is to compare it to other businesses, similar businesses. Just sticking to the airline example, a multiplex is very much like an airline. Both require a minimum usage for them to make money, high operating leverage businesses. So understanding the business, that's the first part. The more important part is understanding the management. And when we think about management, the key basic is what is the intent of the management and integrity. Intent means a lot of things, but getting to the core, how you think about how a business makes money is also very, very important. Is the business being run for ego? Is the promoter running the business so he has three children and each one will get a division and you know, that's the way his thought process is? Uh, or professionalizing and they can think about scale. So various ways to think about it, but trying to understand the intent of the business is very, very important. And of course, we are trusting our money to somebody, so integrity becomes extremely important. There are businesses which are created just for market capitalization. Once the intent is known, you know that integrity could be questioned, and you know, it's up to us then to play it or not to play it. Capital allocation, extremely important. How the business will generate cash flow. Within an industry, can somebody shrink working capital, be more capital efficient? Where the returns if generated will get invested? Not necessarily in the same business diversification, but do they have the capability? So the capital allocation becomes extremely important. The important thing is, does the business generate cash? If not today, at least sometime in future. Then comes execution. Is the management thinking of scale? Market share gains, cost leadership, depending on the nature of the business. But the key message is understanding the management can give you an edge because markets are generally efficient. Most of the information gets captured in the price quickly. But if you can sort of analyze the management, you can develop an edge. So I think this is one of the more critical aspect and it's the art and it's, 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 it's the tougher bit. Uh, there's no easy way to understand it. Uh, experience and a lot of other things are required. <clears throat> then comes the concept of value. It's a theoretical concept. Roshi talked about cash flows, but you could have a rule of thumb. PE is nothing but a summation of cash flow or a rule of thumb for cash flow. Uh, growth, sustainability of growth, returns determine P multiples. If you look at a consumer company, it'll trade at higher multiple because returns are higher, period of growth is higher. Industrial company, more cyclical, should trade at lower PE. So it, it's just a framework to work with something. It's an art. There's no exact science to it that it is a 15 multiple, 20 multiple, things change. Uh, but you need something to work with. You can't just not work with something. You need, you need a sort of an anchor. Now, take this sort of a simple framework or, or this framework, and let's look at a few examples. 
and uh, what the past kind of tells us. So I'll start with IT services. It's been one of the best industries in India, 8% of GDP. There were 300,000 people or 3 lakh people in 2000 employed in this industry. Today it's 5 million, 50 lakh people, and 2030 expected to be uh, 10 million people. So there has been scale. This has been an extremely capital efficient industry. Uh, since 2000, 4.9 lakh crores has been returned as dividend and buybacks by this industry over this uh, 20 year or 22 year period. High returns and reasonable growth, which has been cyclical. So extremely good industry, returning 4.9 lakh crores. Wow, that, that's something. But if you look at such a great industry and think about how many businesses have scaled, only two are above $50 billion market cap today. That's Infosys and TCS. And there have been many casualties along the way. So from 95 when Infosys listing happened to now, there has been a Satyam, a Pantafor, there has been Visual Soft. So in a great industry, there were bad intent managements and there have been casualties. Not all businesses have scaled. Only the companies which created management structures and rode each technology cycle well could kind of sort of uh, uh, scale. One interesting aspect which makes me very bullish on India also is that from these larger companies, Cognizance, Infosys, and uh, TCS, managers came who had scaled some divisions, some verticals. They went to smaller companies and they have been able to scale so that management coming in, professionalization coming in, has been a great success story uh, within the various cycles this uh, industry has seen. So in a great industry also management matters, not everybody scales. If you look at a very long term picture, 15 years, the market capitalization and the profit growth have kind of mirrored each other. Uh, this is from 04 to 19, 20. I just uh, did not look at the COVID period because it distorted a lot of things. So I thought like, you know, it's just kind of an indicative uh, thing that the market caps and uh, returns have kind of correlated with each other. The profits you earn, the market cap you got. In fact, uh, most of the ratios look the same, but the scale is very different. In 2000, 2005, when TCS listed, the profits were 2,000 crores, and in 22, the profits are 38,000 crores. So almost 20x profits and similar returns TCS has given from 05 to 22. So that was the long-term picture. Now let's break it down into smaller buckets of five years, because not everybody can invest for 15 years, go through the cycles. Within smaller time frames, if you think about it, an Infosys from 95 to 2000, the profit CAGR was 85%, and the market cap CAGR over that five-year period was 150%. So really, the PE expanded a lot more than the profits. And then if you look at from 01 to 05, profits still compounded at 46%, but the market cap compounded at 10%. So kind of sort of profits had to grow into the market cap. The interesting part about this journey of Infosys is, again, you had Asian financial crisis in 97 when the world was coming to an end, then you had dot-com bust, the world was coming to an end, then GFC happened, the world was coming to an end. But if the profits came over the period, the value kind of followed. So yes, the macro worries you, and, and kind of sort of, as they say in history books, uh, World War II would be three chapters, and the Asian financial crisis is like two paragraphs over a period of time. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind, that the uh, world will always come to an end, and then it just continues. But getting that profit and scalability right is very, very, or focusing on that is uh, equally or more important than worrying about the world is coming to an end. Then you zoom in more and look at the short term. And I know more analysts follow Infosys. On a yearly basis, the volatility is even more. You worry about the body language, the rupee dollar, everything. And it all matters. I'm not saying it's trivia. But the time frames just can sort of determine how you want to analyze or what you want to do with the company. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, but just on a longer time scale, profits and market cap kind of come together. 
shorter time frame, the noise and the news flow is what? Every guidance of a quarter will make a 7 10% sort of movement in the stock price, but over long term, uh, it just doesn't matter. So from IT services, let's move to diagonally opposite or you know, 360, 180 degrees, whatever, into real estate and see what happened out there. Again, it's a big sector. Everybody needs a house, so real estate will be huge, and uh, Anorox says there will be a one trillion sector, not market cap, but a sector uh, potential in 2030. So it's a large sector. We know housing is uh, a universal thing. But it's a very capital intensive sector. Since 2007, the listed real estate companies have raised uh, almost 70,000 crore as equity capital. Scalability has been difficult. It's a very regulated sector. Every municipality, every state has its own regulation. So there are no pan-India companies as such. Companies attempt, but it's been difficult. So scalability has been a question. And it's a cyclical sector. Uh, deep cycles, long cycles, but it is a cyclical sector. So if you look at the scalability in a large sector, only one company today is over $10 billion of market cap. That's DLF. And given the nature of the sector, and again goes back to intent and integrity, the casualties in this sector have been many. In IT, there were a handful out of the 100, 120 companies which got listed during the initial periods. Here, you would find a lot more companies. Uh, one, just the nature of the business, and then the integrity and in intent. Uh, Probably profits is not the right way of thinking about the sector because just the nature of the sector, what it is. But over long term, the profits have not compounded and the market caps have struggled for the sector. And to be fair, there's been a real estate downturn cycle since the time the companies got listed, but it's been a tough sector. Look at DLF. It's a very interesting example. After it listed, it just shot up. The market at that point in time discounted everything possible. Whatever the land bank was, it was given a discounting of that it will get executed tomorrow. And from there on, it's been 50% down the stock price till today from the peak. Again, unfair because it's a point in time. But I just want to emphasize a point when in the frenzy of 2007-8, uh, everything got discounted. And then it has taken a long time because execution has been tough. Slowly scale is coming. And in 1718, the company restructures its balance sheet, debt comes down, volumes pick up, and from the bottom, stock is up to 2.5%. So in a cyclical sector, you can make money, but if you discount everything and it's uh, more difficult, uh, you have to time the cycles extremely well. Also, one of the examples here is Jayaprakash, which comes to mind. They spent 10,000 crores to build the Jamuna Expressway in that time frame and got 10,000 acres of land from Noida to Agra. And the whole damn thing was discounted in the price that time, and the stock still went bankrupt, despite having 10,000 acres of land, which they couldn't monetize. So let's move from real estate to a sector which is related to real estate. The key underlying driver is the real estate sector, which is the consumer durables and the electrical sector. Growth is driven by underlying real estate and renovations. It's higher ROC than a real estate, 20, 25% returns, which are good given the cost of capital. And it generates good cash flows. So you have seen the sector emerge from a listed and organized sort of uh, space during the 2005, seven. And over the last 15, 20 years, uh, good money has been made in the sector. It started from a very small base. The profit pool is still small. There are three companies within the five to $10 billion market cap. And more companies are emerging as unorganized to organized movement is happening. So it's interesting how uh, choosing shovels and picks rather than the gold miners has helped to create value. <clears throat> and again, this is noticed in China where real estate becomes huge. But people who invested in the white goods space or the building materials space made a lot more money because it was just more capital efficient. The same underlying demand driver. <clears throat> the runway for growth is long. It's a new sector starting from a small base. So the market caps have been growing ahead of the profit growth. 
the PE re-rating has been very, very sharp. Let's look at the poster child from this sector, Havels. A lot of value has been created. It's a great company, uh, great management. But if you look at it, especially in the last five-year period, profits have compounded 11%, market cap 23%, generally over the last 10 years. So if you were to think ahead, either the profits go into the market cap or profits have to surprise you. Let's see how it plays out. No recommendations, nothing, but just a framework of thought that great businesses also, if the market caps run ahead, will they take time? It's going back to the Infosys example of 01 to 05 when the market cap had to sort of go into the profits. So those are the three examples, just sort of setting a base for a discussion that underlying all complexity, there is simplicity. You have to build an investment framework or you have to have a framework. You have to simplify the things, although it's a complex world, to deal with it. Thinking long-term is extremely important. Long-term sort of uh, focuses you on value rather than what is next, uh, helps you avoid that noise, and it gives time for a business management to really play out. Uh, minimizing mistakes is important. You can't blow up. If you blow up, you're out of the game. To win a race, you have to finish a race, and this is a never-ending kind of a race. And the last point, uh, conclusion I would leave is compounding doesn't require great returns. Good returns over a long term is what is really needed. So we all look for 10 baggers, but 10 bagger is nothing. You can find a business which compounds 25% over 10 years, that is a 10 bagger. That's how compounding uh, sort of works. Lastly, I would just leave you with a quote again, uh, which summarizes what Roshi also said, Warren Buffett's goes. But here I'm just quoting sort of uh, uh, Terry Loughlin. Uh, drawing, drawing parallel between swimming and investing. Swimming is a very unnatural thing for humans. You get into water, you panic, you're not supposed to float, you're supposed to sink. So Terry's formed total immersion for endurance swimmers, and he broke down the process of swimming into simple parts, and you could constantly sort of improve upon it and it made the whole journey extremely simple. And uh, what he says is that uh, it, it's, 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 it's not an end. Improvement is a constant journey, and that's similar for investing. It's a constant journey to learn. You have to keep an open and flexible mind. New business models emerge. New information comes. Uh, new way of looking at things comes. You have to absorb. You have to keep learning uh, to kind of stay in the game and hopefully not win, but just sort of uh, be ahead of the game. So that's all. Thank you. And uh, over to. Thanks a lot, Sandeep, for your session. Uh, I, let, me, let me start the Q&A with something which I've been uh, discussing half of uh, yesterday. So your framework, does it just work for value but for growth companies too? Because especially the growth companies right now, as the entire Gurgaon is, are suffering with having really grown in the pure bull market and now uh, not able to come in terms with valuation? So growth is part of value. Again, this question came up in the first session also, and I strongly believe growth is part of value. Value is you're trying to discount the profits back or trying to think about profits. And growth is as important, and I consider myself as more growth. You are in an emerging market like India. Uh, growth is what you are sort of looking for. You're not really looking for deep value. Uh, it won't exist because everything is underpenetrated. So growth is what you have to focus on. And again, growth, value, these are definitions. You have to find the right business and see whether you're paying a fair price for it. Uh, I think uh, it's confusing to try to bucket things into things. It's the same thing. It's like uh, three years back, Sequoia was the poster child, and Berkshire was not doing well. Three years later, Berkshire has again become so good, and Sequoia is sort of blowing up. So there's, there's like uh, cycles, but I think. Uh, but how would you use this to, say, uh, value a new age company? How, what would, how would the structure? So I'm not a venture capitalist, but having read a lot of those guys and what they have got it right and looking at history of some of those, uh, there's no balance sheet to look back. There's no cash flows. 
They bet on the market and the management team, and then serendipity, because the businesses pivot. And they are successful. It's not that they have not made money. They make a lot of money. So that's a framework to work with. And there's nothing right or wrong about it. And they value things differently. It's market cap to sales, price to gross profit, because you're valuing the market, the potential market. You're betting on technology. And nothing wrong with it. If you're good with it, you understand it. Absolutely, you can make a lot of money doing that. Perfect. Uh, let's let's uh, stay with the framework part. Now, how does the framework work for uh, cyclical sectors like, say, the construction sector? So I started my journey at Fidelity as a regional steel metals mining analyst in 2002. And after 20 years of downturn, the metal sector was just taking off. And it was a great learning. So steel companies, which were trading between 0.2 to 0.6 times POSCO, I remember so clearly. So I was told that it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it goes, you buy it, 0 0.6, you sell it. And it shot through to two times book. And wow, China happened then. And then it has again come back. So the fundamentals of the business caught on. So when you think about cyclical businesses, uh, the price you pay becomes a very, very important element because the profits kind of mean revert. But within a cyclical business, you can get growth. So Sri Cement example in India. Cement is a cyclical business, but it got traded as a consumer company because they were the cost leaders, capital allocation was good. It could happen with some steel businesses. So, but the price discipline, what you pay, becomes extremely important because the profits can kind of disappear, demand supply, all of those things matter. So it's again a framework to work with, and there could be growth within the cyclicality, but understanding the cycle and how much you're paying for that cycle becomes very, very important. Uh, perfect. Uh, now, one of the questions that's been discussed in this forum before has been on PSUs. Now, how would you think of investing in PSUs versus the private sector? How would you look at PSUs? So it goes back to the management, the intent. What is the intent? Is it for the minorities or it is for, because the taxpayers are the large shareholders. So is it for the public in general? And then comes the capital allocation. One thing sure about the PSU companies is that uh, they can't fire employees. So the wage bill compounds at between 8 to 12%. If they can't keep up with revenues, over a long period, wages will be higher than the revenues. We have seen a lot of these examples. But there are some good PSUs also. So again, you know, bucketing yourself that I will do this or I won't do this is wrong, I think. Whatever you are good at, if you can't do it, avoid it because you got to fish in the pond where there are more fishes and uh, you know how to fish there, I would say, is more important than anything. Uh, we've got an interesting <coughs> question by Pavan Aroda. Uh, how have you used profitability CAGR vis-a-vis -vis market cap CAGR as an investment matrix? If yes, how would you use it to time an investment? An example as well, please. So I constantly use that. So the way I would think about it is that, uh, let's take an example, again, not a recommendation. So you look at a company, and not, not, let's not look at a very small company. Uh, let's look at SBI cards, it's earning 1,600 crores. Or uh, HDFC mutual fund, or any business. If SBI cards is earning 1,600 crores, can it earn 5,000 crores? What will it take? And if it if earns 5,000 crores, what can be the market cap potential of that business if it continues to grow after that also at a rate? So it just helps frame the whole question correctly, and then you can work backwards and figure out what drives this business. And to do that, then you go back to the unit economics of the business that if per card they earn 1,100, 1,200 rupees, how many cards holders they need? And does it make logical sense that this can happen within a reasonable time frame, so you get your compounding from the price you are sort of uh, putting up. So it's the same problem. You can do it from an Excel sheet way, or you could just frame a problem, understand the unit economics, and think about it. Uh, but it really helps that uh, when you're looking at a business and its scalability, that uh, this 100 crore profit, to reach 500 crores, then you really make money. What would it take? Does this business has the market or the management bandwidth? So just one example, I used to be a pharma analyst when I started my career. 
And in 2000s, I saw pharma companies getting stuck at 200 crore profit for years. Two reasons. For a pharma business, you need a manufacturing plant. So to make the second and the third plant, some companies did not have enough cousins who would manage those plants. And some companies just took time to invest in those plants to grow. And once that happened, and once they reached 500 crore, the market cap grew. And then you see companies with 2,000, 3,000 crore market cap over that period, and the compounding has been phenomenal. Uh, there's, there's an interesting, again, another interesting question by Sajal Jain. And uh, that's something uh, I, I kind of uh, uh, wanted to ask too, because I've just read uh, a book on uh, the tulip uh, uh, mania. Now, how do you discount irrationality in our models Why making investments? So, it's, irrationality is always there, it's long term, it's short term, how do you discount that? You, you can't model irrationality, you can see it and you have to run through experience. So, one of uh, colleagues at Fidelity always say that, uh, find me a bubble and I want to be there because I can make a lot of money there. <laughs> so, you don't need to avoid it. You don't need to get carried away. We can all rationalize. Today morning, we were speaking with Saurabh that, uh, we can all be very rational and say that, no, no, this is the price and we lose out everything. So there's a fine balance, otherwise all of us would be very rich, right, if there was a simple formula. Yeah, no, probably. I, I ended up uh, doing that with subprime back in my investment days. But yeah. So uh, the other, other question is by Jitendra. And uh, he's, he wants to ask, how do you track and incorporate macro views and geopolitics in your framework? How do you deal with the complexity so macro is important. Uh, there has to be some framework. But you go back to the Infosys example. Uh, Asian financial crisis, world was coming to an end. It just continued. So what you can control is most important. So you know, analyzing one business, one industry, understanding that management is tough, figuring out what Putin is going to do and how Biden is going to react how much time you want to waste on it and how much time you want to sort of, you know, get transfixed to CNBC. Uh, what outcome will be there? It is important. So from an emerging market perspective, just knowing the deficit, uh, current account, very good indicators I use that once they start moving up, you know that some accidents can happen, but how long would it take, not take? Uh, it's just a back something to keep uh, in your sort of background, but focus on uh, businesses because uh, not an economist and macro. They're very successful macro investors as well. Not that it's not doable. What game you want to play, you have to decide, and then the time frame and how you want to play it. But is it also something that you incorporate in the margin of safety when you're looking at a particular uh, very difficult. You can say that the discount rate uh, has moved up, so PEs have to come down, but for five years, people made that argument, and it's, it's a fine art. You got to sense it, and you figure it out, but you got to stick to the good management and profit, because that's more uh, forecastable, and something you can fall back upon. Talking about valuation, I think uh, uh, Ram Ramnik has a question which is uh, similar to, in line to what we're discussing which is we've seen robust companies, but also trading at steep valuation. How does a practitioner like you gauge what is baked in the price already and how much value is yet to be uncovered? So that's a tough one. Uh, why I say that? There have been examples. Let's look at Page Industries again in 7-8. Trading at very high multiples, but the profits were growing at 40-50%, and if they could grow, the profits grew into the market cap, and then the compounding of 15, 20% after that could still happen. So if the growth aspect is there short term, high P multiples are OK, because the profits quickly grow. But if the growth is discounted too long term, then it sort of, uh, and I think these questions keep coming up from an India context more as for the multinational companies and the FMCG companies. Uh, I think it's very unique to India because they don't dilute and the holders keep holding. So there is a supply demand sort of issue about it. And mentally you can say that these businesses are there for 50 years. But within that period, so Hindustan Unilever did not do anything for 11 years and then the compounding happened. So profits ultimately grow into the market cap, but there are certain unique sort of uh, things where, again, in 2000, Glaxo was trading at 70 times. Then it did not do 
anything because the profit growth wasn't there. So long term, these two things kind of converge. Uh, there are unique circumstances which you've got to ex accept and respect. And it's all of those things put together. Perfect. Uh, there is a question by Pradeep on guide us on simplicity of exit strategy with examples. In a tough one. So cyclical businesses is very, very simple. You know that this is what you want to pay. And then the cycle goes up. So you got to always think when you sell something or at the price you want to sell something, somebody has to buy it from you. So leave enough for that person that he sees something in it. Otherwise, why the hell would he buy it from you? It's the marginal buyer or seller which determines the price. The tough part is good businesses, which can sort of stagnate for some time. Do you exit and you enter or you wait for compounding? And uh, that's really the tough question. And <clears throat> it depends on your time horizon what your mentality is, what kind of capital you are sort of managing, will that be patient enough or no? Uh, but uh, that's really a tough one. I would tend towards owning it through the cycle because it's very difficult to sell something and buy it more expensive because if it falls, it will fall for a reason. It's not going to fall because you need to buy it back. Or there is a COVID event or GFC happens when you can buy, but who knows, you can keep waiting for those events. And the compounding has already sort of, you know, brought to. So I would tend to hold, and in cyclical businesses, I would tend to just sort of uh, happy to let go of the returns which could be. Thanks. Uh, the other question is from uh, Keyur. Uh, and uh, it's something actually which is interesting uh, because you could probably in some way uh, answer it because you've both been a professional money manager and an entrepreneur, which is that uh, is equal weight Nifty 100 investing solution for value, growth, active investment, management, integrity, et cetera? So, no, it's bad for my business. It's not. <laughs> But I think active management has a role to play. But if more people, so there is one sort of thought out there that more passives and more quant comes, value investing will die because what they are looking for and if they come with a wall of money, what are you going to do? Is the index changes which will drive stocks for number of years till it comes back because ultimately value and profits will converge. So, it's, it's, let's see how it plays out. I firmly believe active management has a role. You've got to pick the right management. So otherwise, you could have a lot of bad companies out there in the index. And in the world of ESG, but you are an index investor, you will own everything. Uh, it's, I think active invest, investing will continue to be there. The next one is a question by Deepak. And Deepak, that's uh, an argument I always had uh, with my team. As a broker, we always... Uh, uh, do that, which is any annual report you read, they talk about the penetration uh, being less as compared to the US. How much is the statistic important? How would you, how would we be sure that we will reach those penetration levels? And every, every broker report has it too, which is... Uh, it's a good chart to have, uh, <laughs> and it's, a, it's real, it's important, but it's a kind of sort of, we know that there are 10 to 15 crore consumers in this country which can really spend and rest on a 1.2 billion people, everything will look underpenetrated. 40% of them do not have the purchasing power. So within that $2,500 per capita, it is concentrated in the top and the bottom 40% have no purchasing power. They are living hand to mouth, it's sub thousand dollars. So these are good charts to have, but uh, at the end of the day, when you're putting your money to work, you got to be real about it. But do you divide India into different parts? I think one of the theories has been there is a Switzerland in India, there is a US in India, and there's Eastern Africa in India, which is there. So is it to be thought in that way, which is there for the addressable market? So there are 11 cities which contribute to maximum GDP. If the 12th, 13th, 14th become visible, it will become sort of more interesting. And that 13th, 14th could be a Thane emerging or a Noida emerging. So. Uh, it again goes back how quickly this per capita would kind of uh, increase. Uh, Abhinav asks a question from uh, one of your slides earlier, 
And he says, market cap has far outpaced the profits in the consumer durables and the building material sector over the long run. Doesn't it imply that the correlation between profits and market cap doesn't always hold true, even for the long run? As per your framework, when the market cap has outpaced profits for five, 10 years, should one be at, uh, exiting the sector? I'm not sure if that's a specific question you... No, no, have. it's... Uh... It has, so there are no sort of uh, firm laws, laws of physics don't work in a market, but we just try to create frameworks to deal with the markets rather than having a definitive answer to the market sort of uh, thing. So yes, once you see that, then you got to go back and do your homework that whether you believe that the durability of the business is really, really there, that you want to see it 10 years and the markets will compound. So if a stock is trading at, uh, 70 times today because it has been re-rated, but the profit growth is 15% at a ROE, then you go back to your valuation framework and say that uh, probably the right multiple is 35. So the multiple will half, profits will continue to grow at 15. So your compounding is going to be seven, eight percent. If you're happy with that, absolutely fine. Or the profits can grow at 40% and 70 is not 70. You got to figure out, we have to do some work to figure it out. Uh, the next question is by Kunal. How do you build a portfolio with proven good businesses and potential good businesses? What is your likely allocation between businesses which are proven and good and potential? So proven and good businesses, everything gets reflected in the price very quickly. So you got to stretch your time frame and believe. So let's look at an example of DMART. It's proven emerging kind of a thing. If you just do a simple math and you do the unit economics uh, per store, treat it like a utility and say that these are the store economics, so the value of each store is X. Assume they execute everything well, which they have demonstrated. So today's price is discounting approximately, and these are just approximate, I'm just talking from a understanding perspective, again, no recommendations or views on a stock. They're discounting 1,200 stores, whereas they have about 300 stores today. And the potential is go to 5,000 stores. So market is not going to bring it down to 20 times or 15 times for you to be able to invest in it. But if you believe 5,000 stores will happen, so the margin of safety is 1,300 stores you pay for or 700 stores if the stock corrects you want to pay for. And at that point in time, the execution is still equally good. Is the calls you would constantly need to make. But if you keep looking at an EVA bid or PE, maybe it'll never give you an opportunity to invest in it. Walmart compounded similarly 30 years in US. But it was the execution, it was the unit economics of the store, no disruption. So you got to constantly look at that and then define your margin of safety. If COVID happens and it comes to 150 stores and there are 300 stores, wow you'll compound massively. But those are the kind of sort of frameworks you'll have to uh, work with. Uh, the next question is by Prachi. How do you see the impact investing in the context of India? I read PPG BlackRock management are among the top to have such portfolio style. And is it really possible to generate alpha return when there is no such thing according to the Pharma French model? Uh, Talking about deep simplicity, how do we find out management playing like cookie jar manipulation? Sorry, impact words. investing, I, I'm lost. I'm too old, I think, like 26 <laughs> years. And uh, so some youngster is there who has got this thing right. Sorry, if you can define it, uh, I have no idea. There is no simplicity in the question. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sure it's simple. I don't understand it, sorry. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, there is, it's interesting with the regard to BlackRock, with the guy who set it up is a, is a good friend and uh, the amount of money, at least the capital that they're seeing is massive. The return expectations are relatively lower. I think impact investing, them. I get it, is the ESG part that uh, I, 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 so I shouldn't comment, but uh, it's a lot of greenwashing. Uh, you know, oil wasn't part of ESG index and now it is. <laughs> so West versus East, what is ESG? Governance is non-negotiable. You don't believe in cigarettes because it causes cancer. Don't invest in tobacco, you don't want to encourage it. Uh, oil is good or bad. 
I don't know, coal is great for India, otherwise we would have been like, coal India has flatlined the prices for us for power, it's great. Uh, so it's, a, it's an evolving concept. We all need to do something about the environment. And my belief is you've got to consume less. So there won't be GDP growth, there won't be growth, and the valuations will come down and we'll all be in bond world. I don't know what's the answer, yeah. So there's a follow-up <coughs> question by Kubo on ESG itself. That, that do you see ESG as an investable sector with decent returns in the long run with no government or supranational support? Or is it mostly going to be driven by governments, not just... See, we are in uh, capital markets. It is capitalist society we have to believe in, otherwise capital markets would be dead. So it's about what returns can you generate and how growth will be. Within that, the theme of ESG is there. So sustainability is important for the business anyway. If you're not sustainable, you can't get a high multiple. Governance is extremely important. Beyond that, uh, how do you, what is the standard? Is there a standard for ESG or everybody is coming up with a standard and, you know, I, I don't know. Is no, there a definition? So in some sense, I guess. There's no definition for it. So it's good to have everybody believes in it. You can raise a lot of capital, but the underlying principles of sustainability, governance, you can't argue against that. But uh, any theme is very dangerous because you pay for it and then the profits don't happen over a period of time and you realize that, oh my gosh, what was I doing? Uh, we've, uh, uh, Deepak has an interesting uh, question. How do you manage your urge to do something with a lot of excitement in the market? So. <laughs> I go for a long run in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the need for fitness. <laughs> which uh, uh, Gaurav has a question. IR guys these, uh, these days know what investors want to hear. Some tools you use when you read the annual report. So I think reading the annual reports is extremely important. So uh, one of the things which works for me is that uh, forget forecasting, just look at the last 10, 15 years, if there is history of numbers and put it in a format which makes sense to you that ROE, working capital, cash flow generation. And on that, you read what the chairman and the managing director is saying. And does it is it consistent? Does it make sense? You, the numbers kind of correlate to what they are saying is extremely important. And at the end of the day, it's your job to understand the business. It's not the IR guy's job to make you understand it and make money for you. Otherwise, uh, what are we doing? Like, you know, so it's their job to sell. If they are selling, not everybody does. And it's our job to figure out what we want to do. Uh. Kayur has a question, again, with IR and management. Do you have a framework to rate management integrity on a scale of 1 to a high of 10? If yes, uh, I think, Kayur, that would be a specific question which Sandeep will say, no, I'll just ask it for the sake of uh, uh, being a true transfer. If yes, what is the output of your structure for Adani? So, <laughs> first thing, from a scale to 1 to 10, there is no in between. Either it's one or it's nine or ten or there's one. There's no five or six. Uh, how can it be? You know, you then sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad. And specific, it's like uh, not right to comment on anything. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, just this is a very subjective comment. And uh, so the other one is by Jitendra. How does one take action on extremes when things are visibly in bubble? But the timing element is not possible, something like last year. Do you take cash calls in such cases? If yes, what kind of cash drags have you seen in the past? So when I was at Fidelity, that was a more difficult question. But the, the customers used to tell you to be invested, so it was easier. You were beating a benchmark on your own. When you think about absolute, it's a bit tougher. If there are no ideas, you don't invest. But then you run the risk that you become too conservative and you miss out and you are like uh, looking at the TV screen and saying that Ukraine has happened, oil is going there, here, and you know, it's a fine balance. I think uh, going back to the businesses, the management, and thinking the long term that, okay, uh, today it all looks bad, but five years or three years, if it is from 1,000 crore to 5,000 crores, and if you believe it will happen. So again, going back to that framework, 
really helps to ride through all this kind of noise because uh, uh, there are no easy answers. Uh, but from present, if I don't know there are ideas, I'll sit back, but I don't want to take cash calls. I want to find businesses where I can invest because I believe India is still a growth market and there's a lot of opportunity out there to compound and make money. So I don't want to get bogged down by uh, just the macro. somewhere in your uh, yeah, of just your... the macro. Oh, fine. Uh, Sanyam wants to find out what, according to you, are the trend sectors for the next decade in the globe and India? Because no thematics. You... Whatever <laughs> compounds profits, then it's not in the price. I, I, I don't believe thematics work for me. Amulya is asking, specifically for the AMC business, as there is a lot of penetration that needs to be unlocked, especially in India, uh, what, what can investors expect as in? Great returns. It doesn't require capital. There's massive scalability. The only thing is the fees will come down if passives become large or uh, you, know, you have to generate fees from more uh, uh, more fee generating products or whatever, uh, but in next 10, 20 years, nothing has happened in India. It's like financialization has just started. Uh, you go back, look at uh, P multiples of uh, T. Rowe or others, and uh, Fidelity was a private company, but uh, you know the NAV just compounded uh, despite all of these things and scale. So I think. Uh, uh, it's a call you got to take how much the, the pricing will come down and what profits will be at what sort of level. Uh, but it's a great business. And we, we discussed this uh, about the uh, uh, US financial markets, the book that you recommended, yeah. which ended up uh, being very interesting. Now, a couple of uh, questions uh, which are uh, slightly off investing, but uh, uh, what is your advice? For budding analysts from experiences in your career, and I know that you've been a great mentor, so Gaurav is asking this question. And so you got to read a lot, you got to enjoy what you do, and uh, you got to put in the hard work and keep at it. Uh, uh, really, it's just a lot of hard work, and you got to enjoy doing it. So it kind of works out. There's no easy that do X Y Z, but yeah, reading a lot definitely helps. Uh, Kumut wants to find out, do you have, do you always have a target exit price? If yes, how often do you actually sell at the target price? So there's always something in mind, but it's a rolling price because you keep learning when you are invested in a business that what can happen, what can't happen. On day one, you don't know everything. So you start with a hypothesis and it sort of evolves and keeps evolving. Every morning is a new day. Uh, although the turnover ratios in the funds when I was managing or now are been extremely low, but uh, every day is a new day and in public markets you can exit whenever you want. Uh, that's the luxury you have. Uh, so for cyclical businesses, yes, there is a target price and you want to exit a bit earlier, uh, but generally it just evolves. Uh, you, I, I keep sort of rolling forward three year, five year, one year sort of, and just keep a check as to you're not becoming lazy, uh, basically. Uh, Abhishek asks, are there any sectors which are a complete avoid for you? Uh, never say never, but uh, uh, not naming the sectors, but given the bandwidth that the new sort of uh, setup which is there, you want to focus on few things and go deep and do them better. Uh, so it's just prioritizing rather than saying that I'm not going to do this and I'm going to do only this. Uh, but yes, prioritizing is important because the time is only uh, so much. So I, I think like uh, I, I would uh, sort of end there. I've been a steel analyst. Uh, I know that I need to understand the global demand supply and domestic demand supply. Do I have the bandwidth today to be able to do it? It's very tempting. But if I don't know the cycle well, Am I doing the right thing by investing in it becomes the question. So those are the choices you need to make and you would. So your priority sectors? Wherever the profits will grow and the price is reflecting price good. Uh, to be honest, it's more stock by stock in each sector. Uh, there's no sectoral sort of 
theme, what happens is you tend towards looking at a sector, you find a lot of things and then you ignore something because you have that much bandwidth. But it is like really, honestly, it's stock by stock rather than uh, taking sector calls. As an asset manager, what would you give more weightage to? Scalability or profitability? Question by Yash. Both are important. If profits are there and they don't grow, the business gets derated. And then the profits will decline. They will remain stagnant. So growth has its own sort of life cycle. Uh, so I think growth is very important. Uh, so if I go back to that framework chart, management, business, and value, the intersection of the three is the sweet spot. Uh, if you can identify that, then just hold on to kind of those investments for long if you've bought them at the right value. So I think growth is extremely important. Uh, very important because just profitability will not drive value. There is uh, the next question by Shalab, and uh, it's a sort of question which, uh, again, Shalab, I, uh, you've mentioned that there are listed uh, holding companies in India that have a massive hold core discount, even up to 70%. What are your views on this from a value investing perspective? I would also put the other point there are other companies where there is almost no discount being given to the value. So, how do you look at the holding company discount for businesses? So it goes back to the intent, why the holding company is there. Is the cash flow going to come to the minority shareholders or you're just trying to buy cheaper the underlying assets because optically it looks value. If that cash is not going to come to you and it is to control the rest of the businesses, it's like in point in time. So the sum of parts works in bull markets and when the markets turn, very quickly, market just puts the parts together and say, this is the profit. So if you can buy the underlying business, it's very easy to forecast. But if you're buying a cheaper cousin, what is going to unlock that value? What is the intent of the management? It becomes extremely important. So the best is to buy the right business and the right management at the price, right? Because that is the best risk mitigation. But you're not going to get everything right, so you need to have reasonable diversification, but not a lot of diversification. And then usually you build the positions as your conviction grows. So if you buy something at 100, you want to double it at 150 because your understanding has become better and you know that uh, you know the thesis is going to play out. So I tend to build the position sort of uh, slowly rather than putting everything uh, together hoping that I am investing for long term and I'm going to get it right. Uh, so reasonable diversification. And if a lot of cash is coming in, in today's structure, I have the luxury of parking it and curating a portfolio. Uh, but, but when I was sort of in the previous life, uh, it was uh, tougher. So the diversification was uh, longer because if the conviction wasn't there, you won't put 5%, you would put 100 basis point and then slowly build upon it. So the diversification used to increase at that point in time. Uh, but uh, today I would wait and sort of allocate with conviction uh, where I want to invest. One of the problems with having a very big portfolio is you lose a lot of opportunity, which are companies which are starting like Havels when it was here. You could not scale it up at that point of time if you have a big, big fund. I think there is no right answer for it. There are extremely successful fund managers running 700 stock portfolios with great track records. So I think it's about whatever is in your portfolio, are you on top of it? So if you have a team of great analysts and co-investors who can analyze businesses and you can sort of still diversify, again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's about the bandwidth. How much can you do and how much you are on top of is most important. If you have a great 50 analyst team, you're running a global portfolio, you could have 500 stocks and still have great returns. So uh, again, it's, you have to be on top of the stocks which are there or what you want to invest, rather than a right answer to how large a portfolio should be or how small a portfolio should be. Uh, Abhinav asked something which again flows into this is, your investment framework must have evolved a lot over the years. The most important thing that you've changed in your framework Biggest mistakes you committed during your early years as an analyst? So investment framework keeps evolving and it is tending towards if you can buy top quartile managements, your life is easy at 
your age, you want to do more things than just sort of constantly the next excitement. So I think the more you can buy better quality management, good businesses at a fair value, will make life simpler is a realization which keeps coming every day, but to get there is tough and you know, finding them is tough. So that's the attempt and sort of uh, thing. The big mistakes are really uh, not paying up for good businesses. You thought that it is expensive, and then it became more expensive and it kept compounding. Uh, and, and you just sort of uh, missed out on opportunities which you had done all the work and just being too cute about valuations that if it comes to 15 times, I'll buy. It comes to 15, you say, it comes to 12, I will buy. Whereas you should have paid that 25 and the profits should have grown. You don't want to pay 50, 70, but sometimes just the fair value has been the biggest mistakes. The next question is by Amulya, and it's somewhere fits in to what you're trying to do with uh, Eastlink. He asks, how do you understand your investors' expectations aligned with yours as a manager? Is there a specific framework you use for that? Also, what part emotional intelligence plays in asset management business with your clients? So, I've been very fortunate that it's a small set of clients now. And uh, I was very fortunate that uh, Fidelity understood investments extremely well and they let you be and they really focused on your performance on long term to compensate you or whatever. So it was like working with great people, learning a lot, and the right uh, investment frameworks uh, could evolve. Today, the luxury is that you tell them that uh, whoever were sort of giving you money, it's a very small set of clients that uh, uh, you're choosing and picking that uh, they understand what you're doing. It's for long term. You could go wrong. You don't want to take all money. You don't want to grow. Uh, immediately, it's a long-term game. So given the 26 years and some goodwill, that luxury is there. So I'm very fortunate about that as of today. But if two years performance doesn't happen and they run out, I don't know if I'll change my views, but today that luxury is there. Now, there is a hypothetical question. Suppose you invest in a company which is quite profitable, but the stock is quite undervalued. This stock doesn't increase in value for a period of, say, one, two years. And it might not, it might be possible that due to some events, the company becomes unprofitable. Is there a time frame or particular indicator which you should take an exit? It's very hypothetical for you. Yeah, yeah. You've got to check your investment thesis every day, in fact, in the sense you're not trading every day. But if the business model is breaking down or the thesis is breaking down, then the time frame doesn't matter. You remain invested if you believe in the thesis. You're always making a hypothesis, and you're testing it out in the market. And if you believe what you're doing is right, and the profits and the returns are there, uh, ultimately, market will reward it. You've got to keep checking, because the market wisdom is always right, because if the stock price is not working in favor, you've got to go back and check your thesis, that what you are thinking is right or not. Uh, because sometimes, what you think, maybe you have got it wrong. So you got to be sort of open to acknowledging that, and then if the thesis is not there, uh, get out. But if you're very convinced, you would hold on, uh, and it will play out, hopefully. This one has some question which I've never asked you, actually. What is your take on technical analysis? <laughs> hey, you could have asked this question. No, no, it <laughs> works. It works. Technical analysis works. Macro investing works. Everything works. But you got to figure out what's right for you. I don't understand technical analysis, but yeah, then you're invested in a stock, the stock price movement tells you that something is right or something wrong for a period of time and you go back and check your thesis. But uh, more than that, I haven't really uh, looked at technical analysis to time the markets. Uh, Shivang has a question on a sector. What are your thoughts on commodity chemical companies having decent and stable EBITDA margins over the long run? basically manage supply demand businesses, unlike typical commodities? So if it is a commodity company, it will not have a decent EBITDA margin over a long period of time. It will be cyclical. So what part of the cycle you are in, you just need to figure it out. And if the cycle will get elongated, uh, you will still make money. But each chemical is different. You cannot sort of take a broad brush and say, so X chemicals demand supply is different. Y is different, and Z is different. So 
you will need to do the demand supply work and see where you are in the cycle. Uh, China plus one saying just won't work. Short term it may, but uh, you'll have to figure out what's the demand supply and what's the pricing cycle. Uh, all of these chemicals, yeah. specialty or right. commodity, all of these put together, there is a growth opportunity, there is a skill set in India, but you have to figure out where are you in the price cycle and what is discounted. And if you believe over the next five years, the capacities can be large and this margin and profits can sustain, and it's not in the price, absolutely it'll work out. But you'll need to figure out which chemicals and where are we in the cycle. How big is the investment universe with your set of constraints in India? This is a question by Shivani. So we are a team of four, including myself. So we are trying to get to 50 to 60 companies, which we understand very well. And then we'll keep iterating 20 coming in, going out. There's no hard and fast rule because you've got to allocate the bandwidth right. And within that, then it's a 20, 25 stock portfolio, which we'll try to build out. So it's a constant process. But whatever is the bandwidth you need to focus and sort of allocate it right, that's the attempt right now. Sandeep, you've worked with uh, Infidelity and otherwise you've worked with some of the best prints across the world. According to you, who are some of the people slash thought leaders slash invest investors who you look up to for guidance, process, and framework? And what, which are some of the books that you would recommend people to read? So I've been very, very fortunate both locally and working with Fidelity to work with some really, really legendary kind of investors. Uh, there's a long list of people who, who, with whose association I have kind of benefited and learned. And one thing in common was that they were extremely hardworking. Some of the best superstars at Fidelity, uh, we as analysts, when we used to go to meetings with them, they would have outworked you. Uh, every meeting they would be prepared, so professional. And I think uh, that was the biggest takeaway, that uh, to remain that good for long periods of time, the discipline and hard work was just amazing. The understanding and the reading they used to do before going into a meeting of a company was just like phenomenally good. Uh, so uh, the long list of people, association, you know. Any names be, that uh, you would give so that uh, people could Quite a few names, them. yeah, quite a few names. So very fortunate, all the star investors in Fidelity I had opportunity to work with them, go for company meetings with them, learn, observe, had an opportunity to interact and ask, like, this is not working, what to do? So extremely fortunate to have gotten that opportunity, honestly. And in terms of books, any books that you would recommend for the audience here and otherwise? I'll share a list uh, of the top of the mind, always what you're reading right now comes up. Uh, so that looks like the best book, but you keep rereading, reading, rereading, and you get more out of a book, a good book when you read the second time. So I, I can share a list of top of the mind right now. It will be the same names which come, but uh, yeah, more thoughtfulness is required. Like as Perfect. that John O'Sara's book, That's uh, an amazing Picking book. the Pieces. That's an amazing I think it's an amazing book, uh, which anybody who's investing in banking sector should read. It uh, kind of talks about the financialization of US market from 1950s to 1995. And after reading the book, I realized why Bajaj Finance and HDFC Bank did what they did from 95 to now. Because just that retail DNA or whatever, or it's like uh, the whole perspective on the sector changed. So that's one of the books. No, and it's, 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 a, it's a rare book, but worth it. It takes a month to come. Has to kind of but read what? that book. Uh, it's Joan a piece Osera. of action by Joan piece Osera. Piece of action by Joan Osera. So your take on Credit Suisse Startup Future? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. We'll, we'll move on to no the IT uh, service sector. The last two or three decades have been fabulous for IT services sector. What is your view on the sector for the coming decade? Uh, asked by Prankul. I think it will be a great sector, but whichever company writes the tech cycle and the management structure as well will be able to do well. And it is a cyclical in that sense, that growth rates of 15, 20% get discounted, they fall to 10. So what is a fair value you need to figure out, but it's high return, high cash flow generating sector with growth, 
And you also have to remember that uh, you know, within this, if you look at globally, Accenture has survived, but IBM, EDS, there have been a lot of casualties in the sector because their business model or their uh, management structure or they did not write the tech cycle well. So that cyclicality aspect kept in mind. The underlying sector is still sort of great. What price you pay for it, need to figure out, but uh, it will be, for the next five, 10 years, a very good sector to be. Uh, uh, we're, we're up to the last few questions. Now, what is your view on coffee can investing? Is it deep simplicity of retail investing? So absolutely, if I can find great managements at a fair price, good businesses, I would love to kind of buy them and I can have a good life not worrying about things every day. But getting there is uh, tough in hindsight. Everything looks very, very easy. For next 10 years, which will be the ones, requires a lot of hard work and it just becomes like uh, the coffee can is in the hindsight and not with foresight. Kiska, sorry? In stocks? Ugly bar bullying and it will be very difficult. <laughs> and if you're investing X, please invest in my fund and we'll discuss. <laughs> now, the last question was uh, actually asked the first, and I've kept it for the last because it is a non-investment but an interesting question. It's by Mukul. What is your fitness mantra? <laughs> no, no, this, this, I enjoy endurance sports, so did a couple of marathons and did a half Ironman, so really enjoy endurance sports. It's, uh, uh, it's interesting. It just keeps you going. But whatever works for you, it really works for me. And uh, it's discipline. It gives me time to think. So it's, it's, uh, I really enjoy it. And if you're for it, definitely attempt it out.